when I made up the list of the lectures for Philosophical Research Society, I said to myself, well, what would I like to talk about? Now that's not the right way to approach a subject. It should be, what should the audience prefer, be interested in? But I decided, no, I haven't really had too many opportunities to talk about the subjects that I have chosen. Therefore, I thought it would be an excellent way for me to reflect on the things that most interest me. And therefore, among all the topics, this is the, as it were, the highest, the most profound. And certainly the, not only most profound, but the highest concept in philosophy. Religion, life of the spirit. Essentially, what these two words mean, which of course we went through last time we talked, they're identical. Good, same as the one. The good is that which all things desire. Any desire is for something that is regarded as good. The ultimate expression of that highest desire is the good. Ah, big use of the word the. Everything in this room that you distinguish, you distinguish it as one. We went through a kind of dialectic last time to show that the ideas that you use to identify the one can be exchanged for the other and therefore there's an equivalence between the two. Now this week we thought it would be worthwhile to talk about that very interesting philosopher Plotinus. Now we're in the third century AD. Plotinus lived in Rome only after he was 40 years of age, he traveled to Rome. He was an Egyptian. The portraits of him, the sculpting of him, clearly show facial features of an Ethiopian, Egyptian. I have an excellent book, translation, which by the way, never mentions his origins, but just picks up the fact that he moved to Rome when he was 40 and says nothing at all about his birthplace or his origin or his racial origin either. So that's unfortunate, but we can, we can make up for it. He's part of that strange tradition which the, the work Black Athena covers about the African roots, the Africo-Egyptian roots of the classic Hellenic culture. Now, what is it that Plotinus did? First, let me give you the architecture, <clears throat> which at this point you're familiar with. The highest expression is the one or the good. The realm of intelligence. Soul, soul and body, that's basically the metaphysics, the model, the one good. Intelligence, sometimes called being, intelligence being vitality, hyphenated. Soul, world soul, soul and body. Now, what does this really mean? Let's take it this way. Here, of course, we have a figure already drawn on the board, but I'll draw my own. All right. And what this really is showing is that 
what we experience in the realm of experience <clears throat> we can identify we can identify with what is seen through the senses and this is much of our life And then from identifying with the objects of the senses, we also reflect on them, and we reflect on that, and then we have a set of ideas that we use to talk about the impressions we gain from the external world. So what does that mean, you see? This is really nothing other than what affects us, see, what affects us. The word impression is a good word. It's what impresses us. But what is it that is impressed, right? What is it that receives the impressions? What is it, right? What's the it? Now, we can talk about the next level. We can talk about the level of soul. Now, for the idea of soul, all we need is four ideas. If you planned to come here, which you must have done, right? You must have had a plan. You must have willed yourself to use it or commanded yourself to do it. And you did it because in some way you thought you would benefit. Now, what is it, what is it that does this? What is it that wills, that commands, that plans, that seeks a benefit? What is it? Now one more thing we need to this idea of soul, and that is whatever it is, it brings with it life. <clears throat> and, and it unifies. It unifies the sense experience. It unifies a set of ideas into intelligible statements. It presents us with the results of it. Therefore, it does these four things and it brings with it life and it unifies its experiences. But what is it? Well, we can talk a good deal about the soul now since we mean by it these four things that brings along with it the power of life and it's unifying, it ex it's, uh, unifies our experiences or what experiences. But what is it is elusive. What is it? Right? So you see, if it wills, what is it that wills? If it commands, what is it that commands? What is it that does all of this? We could ask it this way. And whatever it is we do, we could ask, what is it that does all this? We're still in pursuit of the it. Now, if we're very serious in our endeavor to try to grasp what that is, we'll deal, it will deal us a very strange card, confusion, perplexity, and you know you're doing well. Puzzled them, you're doing better the depth of puzzle when you're getting close. You can probably reduce this one more step. We'll go two steps, but the next step is, you might say, just what is it, and forget the rest of it. 
What is it? Buddhists have a very nice variation of this. What is it that is seeing and hearing at this very moment? What is it right now that's seeing and hearing? Right? I'm seeing. There's something seeing. There's something hearing. What is it that's doing that? What is it? Can we find out what it is? Now the biggest problem in this pursuit will become clear in this very simple exploration. I can ask when when did you arrive here? Clearly that involves time. Where are you? Location. How? How is that made? How are you sitting? That's parts to whole question. Who are you sitting there? Oh, do you want a name? Or do you want to know what's being named? <clears throat> We could go on with which, if you like, alternatives. But look here, you see, the question really is, if I add now, why, if I ask why are you here, why is that table here, why are you, that requires some kind of explanation. Right? But it presupposes the existence of the thing. Why is this chalk? Well, it presupposes there is a chalk, you just want to know the why about it. It already presupposes you've answered the what. Who are you? That already assumes you know the person. It deals with a person. You just want to know something about that person, the name. How is that put together? already assumes it exists, you just want to know how it's put together. Where is it? Oh, you just want the location, you're not worried about it. When, the same thing, you're not worried about it, you're worrying about the time in which you can describe or talk about it. How do you know when you've answered a what question? This is the entire problem. You see, none of these questions is in any way separated from a what. Because I can ask a when question in terms of a what. What time is it? When did you get here? What time did you get here? Where are you sitting? At what location are you sitting? I can translate every one of these into a what. Location. Pardon me? Location. Yes, every one of them. Here's the whole problem, you see. We know how to answer these, and therefore each one of these can be translated into a what question. But does the what question ask something that is absolutely unique to which none of these answers would, satisfy, would be satisfying it? Look, try it again. If I ask, what is it that is seeing and hearing? Would a when work? Would you, could you use a when to answer that? What is seeing and hearing? Do you mean right now? No. Yeah, but that doesn't give me the answer to what it is it that's seeing and hearing. Ah, say, is there something right now that is, that is uh, seeing and hearing? Yeah, where? If you know where, does that tell you what it is? No. How? Who? Therefore, the big mystery in all philosophy is this question. Is there any legitimate reason why we should use a what? 
because philosophy and our kind of philosophy only deals with the what question, none of the others. If you like when, study history. If you like where, geography. How, any kind of mechanics. Who, psychology if you like. Why, causation. Reason. Uh uh, what? So, what is it that wills, that commands, that plans, that benefits? <clears throat> Now, there are many philosophers that come in and say, you cannot ask that question. There is nothing there, there is nothing there that you can point to that could satisfy that question. And in a way, they're right. There is no thing there. There's no thing. There's no box inside of me there's no pink box inside of you that you can say, that's me. Because someone would ask, pardon me, did something notice that green box that you call you? And we would be left with the same riddle. Good heavens, there must be something watching that. We can't be the thing that's watched. Now let's go a step further then. If you're pushing this question then, steadfast, moving forward into the what, oblivious to everything else, focused entirely on that question, then slowly all of the answers that you try out fail. They come up repeatedly, they fail. Finally, thank goodness the mind loses interest in failures and they no longer come up. And then the mind quiets. Then the mind quiets. And then you're moving beyond the mind, beyond what we would call, let's just call it the thought realm for the moment, just beyond the thought realm. Now you only have occasional thoughts that come by. Now, you might either like these or dislike them. If you like them, then you might entertain it and consider its consequences and you go off on a trip. Or you may not like it and therefore you may get involved in trying to put it down or accusing yourself of being a this or a that for having such thoughts. But when that settles to, when that settles to, then we're in a different kind of realm now. We're open up to a different kind. Right? Now, <clears throat> Now, you see, if it now stays in this way, quiet, unwavering, then something interesting happens. There's a kind of luminosity that emerges. There's a luminosity that naturally emerges. This is capable of of profound, profoundly expanding itself in all directions. This is the luminous, radiant, pure light. There is a unity here. This is a mystical state, as they call it. One is face to face with what is living. This is a living. This is a vitality, vastly vital, radiant, brilliant, intelligible mind stuff. And it's the very nature of mind. Recognize that in that sense very clearly. Therefore, in the Greek world, that's called intelligence. That's this realm. Right? Luminous, radiant. Upon analysis, therefore, you can see it's mind itself. It's mind perceiving mind. It's mind stuff encountering mind stuff. It's the vitality which is not different than your own. 
Therefore, this is a oneness. We talked about this. This, of course, is in the eleventh chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, Ishvara. Uh, it's described as the uh, ten thousand suns bursting fully radiant in the heavens, all at once in a total unity. Now, if you can, here's where we're moving now. You see, by reflecting, we can say, that's luminous, that's radiant. Mind, 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 ah. Vitality, mind, my mind, it's mine, no difference. You are making distinctions in this experience by reflection. Therefore, it is a oneness. not a one. It's a multiple without divisions, but distinctions can be found and made within it. And it does exist, therefore it has being, therefore clearly it has predicates, its qualities. When this is encountered it is bliss, One can enter it to in, into it more profoundly. It's not one experience that admits of a whole range of depth. It has great power. It's not a weak thing. It's, it has great power. <clears throat> it has the force of, uh, of being itself. One has to be in good condition for it, by the way. Plato talks about it excellently in the symposium. He says, uh, you have to, before entering into this experience, you have to grow, gain strength and grow by contemplating the great ocean of beauty and giving mag many magnificent speeches and the abundance of philosophy and thoughts. He says, that builds you up. That builds you up for this experience, since it's an overpowering experience. Great power, great power. Only the you know, to, to go into it more fully requires greater and greater strength, psychic strength, physical strength. But that's a oneness. Now, what does this do? This allows the person who experiences it or hears about it <clears throat> to come to the conclusion that there is something beyond the physical realm, that this is not capable of coming and going. It's what totally is, it always is, and therefore by necessity it's eternity, because eternity means in Greek or something that always is. So the experience is eternal, the nature of it is eternal, therefore you encountered something that's eternal. By the way, notice though, if and experience it, you recognize that it is no different than your own mind, then you recognize in that instant that there is a part of you that enters into this, that you recognize in it, that is eternal. Oh, wait a minute now. has a more interesting, much more interesting aspect to it. Uh, in this you identify, hey, me, I, no difference. Why is that interesting? It's interesting for this reason, you see. <clears throat> uh, it has a profound, ex this has a profound impact on fantasy life. Let me tell you why. It has a profound effect on one's fantasy life. Hmm? Want me to do it again? It has a <laughs> profound effect on one's fantasy life. Okay. Explain. Yes. The essential feature of every fantasy 
is that you can identify with the figure in your fantasy as yourself. Agree? Yep. I mean, can you think of going to a party where you're able to, to everyone writes down their fantasy, and you give it to your neighbor, you can use theirs instead of yours? <laughs> because you have to identify with it. Therefore, in this experience, you discover what you want to call the self. Therefore, if you have an, a fantasy going, it only can go for a short period before you recognize that's not me. That's only a shadow and image. Therefore, it doesn't have that contrast that it would, right? It doesn't have, when you don't have the contrast, you only have the image, then you think that's you. But in this experience, if you see profoundly that that's not you, it weakens, therefore, naturally, any hold on fantasy life, does it not? So we watch some movies and don't like others. Oh, yeah. So, don't. Yeah, here comes one. Oh. <laughs> oh. Don't have to fight them, right? Here comes one. Yeah. Right. Ah. And that's one of the most interesting features about it in terms of psychic development, that the war and all of that drama around fantasy ends. Mm -hmm to the degree that one can participate into it again and again, the more one recognizes that this, here's the big point now, that this cannot be put into an image. Therefore, no fantasy. No fantasy. <laughs> you mean, boy, like, finger to spot it. It can only go, bang, over. <laughs> <coughs> Now, why isn't this enough? Why isn't this enough? You see, in many systems, this is enough. This is the highest realm. Now, for the Neoplatonic and the Neoplatonic tradition, this is magnificent. It's heralded as the most, one of the most important things to experience. But what makes the Hellenic system different than any other system is that they want to bring people look, through each stage. Through each stage. <clears throat> now, there are some systems like Buddhism, <clears throat> certain kinds of Buddhism, Zen Buddhism, where the goal is to skip this. Now, there's a great advantage to skipping it, obviously, because then you may then experience something in one way more profound without having to go through this. The difference, though, by going through it, by going through it, is that it has a profound effect on one's understanding. And we just gave an example of that in fantasy life. You see, when one explores this kind of experience and the conditions for it, you have to be prepared for it. You have to be prepared and able to receive it. You have to become in harmony with it. That means, correspondingly, you have to go through something to appreciate it. This is an experience of the highest kind of beauty. Therefore, any system any system of that all that considers the luminosity significant to the degree that it considers it significant to that degree it has to consider beauty as the cornerstone of its system. It is, it is not possible to have this experience and conceive of anything being more beautiful than that. It is impossible to experience anything higher than that when you are in that. It's impossible to be able to experience that and think that life is worth living if, by the way, you could trade the further penetration into that at the cost of your life, you'd gladly do it. Because it is overwhelmingly beautiful, significant, and profound. And it's you, on the highest level, the self. <clears throat> now,
It's even impossible from some experience, therefore, of this to conceive of anything higher. So you're stuck. You're stuck. <laughs> yeah, right. You are stuck there. Stuck with beauty. Stuck with beauty. Terrible fate. Oh. I'd like to just do that. <laughs> That's and this is why in Plato's Republic, he says, oh, he said some people, you know, get into this experience. They don't want to come back down. They just want to stay there, live in the Isles of the Blessed and enjoy it. Yeah, yeah. And, <clears throat> of course, that happens many places. So that, what is it that propels anyone who has this experience to consider anything higher? First, the very thought that there's something higher is absolutely ludicrous to someone who's experienced this. They can't conceive of anything possible, and they're absolutely right. You cannot conceive of anything higher. Conceive. You cannot picture anything higher. You cannot conceive of anything higher. There's no idea which is higher than that. That's right. There's no experience that's higher than that. That's absolutely right. It seems absolutely amazing and had for, to, in my own world, my own life, practically an astonishing, an absolutely astonishing, that someone who having experienced this could hypothesize something greater. I mean, it's only as if, <coughs> if someone landed here and then came down here, that would be easy to see. But to proceed upward, that's really quite astonishing in terms of human experience. That's astonishing. But, there is something about that experience, you see, and it comes out in one, one very interesting thing. And there's a sadness connected with all of this. And that's why the language for this is the language of love. Has to be the language of love. There's a sadness when you, when you separate from the object of beauty. There's necessarily a sadness you can gain a communion with the object of your love. You can gain it in the most perfect way. But there's going to be a withdrawal at some point. There's always a separation in that way. You can't be that perfect. Well, also, death is going to come. Even if, even if you, you know, the only way to go out is both of you go out holding hands if you have a romantic love like that, right? right? But there, there must be then a coming down, a separation, and therefore implicit in this is a sadness, a profound sadness that enters in. <clears throat> it's terribly sad, and it's because of that that the person who experiences it begins to think, wait a minute, there's got to, there might, there could be, there perhaps, uh, maybe, and the only way out of it is to recognize that if there is something greater, can't be an experience. Can't be an experience. Because experience is temporal, but it is. No. It has a beginning, middle, and end. Mm. So therefore, if this person goes along and stumbles across someone who says, yeah, well, that was pretty good. Had a beginning, middle, and end. Well, yeah. um, ever try to get things that don't have beginning, middle, and end? What? Everything has a beginning, middle, and end. No, 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 no. It's this next step, then, that takes in the higher element of philosophy. Through this discussion, you can see that there is a unity, a union, a communion. All of these words suggest a oneness. And now the whole discussion turns around this higher question now. Is it possible that there is such a thing as the one? Not a oneness, a one. Now, I don't know whether this is <clears throat> altogether true, but I've come to it. I think the only people who can reach the idea of the one are people who have a language capable of representing it. 
because it's by the, the intellect using one's intelligence that we can then say, sir, in that experience of oneness, as beatific as it was, doesn't oneness presuppose one? Yeah, yeah, but it may only be an idea. Well, it does only, it does presuppose a one? Yeah, yeah. Therefore, the intelligence can now turn on the difference between one and oneness, one, oneness, union, unity, communion, and ask a very, very difficult question. And it's the one that is most difficult for people involved in experiences of beauty to face. In the middle of that profound experience, at the heart of it, was there something watching? That's a dirty trick to ask that question. Is there something, what? Is there still some sense of, is there still an it that's experiencing it? If it is, you haven't reached it. And that's said on top of said. Now we have the person caught. <clears throat> And now they have a pestering thought. Because now that suggests something different. Now they have to now go on the quest of, okay, what do I mean by one? What is, what do I mean by one? What is one? What is one? Everything is one. Oh, everything's one? Yes, everything's one. Right. Watch is a one. Coffee's a one. This is a one. Functions is a one. Everything's a one. Well, through this, through this, can we not talk about a particular body, my body being a one? Talk about soul being a one. I can talk certainly about that luminous radiant experience as one. In other words, I can talk about one throughout this whole structure in different ways. Wait a minute. Here we make the biggest jump, and it's, it, is, it is the step into philosophy. It's a very curious step. If there are things like trees or cats and dogs and people and you and I, if there is a similarity between different things, is there a cause for that similarity? If there are different kinds of trees, there's something they all share in being trees. Must there be some idea of tree somewhere that produces the variations in all the different trees we see? Oh, you can do it with music if you want. You can do it with anything you want. Because it comes down to if everything is a one, if everything is a one, and everything that is destroyed or decays as a result of the fact that it loses its oneness, and when the oneness is present, things exist and continue. When they lose that oneness, they enter into destruction, decay, and dispersal. So therefore, there's something about one. There's something about one that's a very powerful notion. Because when you reach it, share in it, then there is that quality to it. Now, wait a minute. But that's things entering into it. That's things entering into it. What is it just by itself? Is that possible to deal with? Well, that's what we want to see. Right. That's what we want to see. Now, <clears throat> for Plotinus, and he's a beautiful writer, he says, by such reflections, Whatever it is you experience, whatever you experience, you must simply say, that's not it. Whatever you experience has a beginning, middle, and end, has a definable part, has a structure, has many things, 
but you're not close to what is it that's experiencing it. So therefore, you can't identify with anything. You don't want to identify anything. You want to let things be the way they are, pull back from it, not even pull back from it. You don't even need that. It's not it. And so, the way he talks about it, however it is, he says, he says we, we have to reach the point where we, we renounce everything else. Renounce everything. And then simply rest in it alone. <clears throat> All we need is the, the impulse, the desire to be free of anything other than it. And this is the great moment, which is, I think, captured most beautifully by saying, you have to drop it all. You have to drop it. Just drop it. There isn't any technique. There isn't any yoga. There isn't any preparation. You can't anticipate it. It's just <laughs> dropping it. <laughs> And when that's possible, <laughs> when it's possible, what happens? You're, you're there. It's free. So to embrace the real object of its love with its entire being, that no part of it does not touch the one, that's the goal. Notice the language again. The language is a language of love. It's the only language capable of, of really understanding philosophy. See? So to embrace the real object, it, right? To embrace the real object of its love with its entire being such that no part of it does not touch the one, it's the one. Notice the language. Now, the curious thing, therefore, in this work on Plotinus, on the good and the one, remember when I first got to it, I was eager to find out all about the one, the good. And you know what he did? He did what I'm doing tonight. I'm not talking about it all, I'm just talking around it. That's right, that's all I can do. <laughs> and, that's the, and that's strange, isn't it? No. <laughs> no, it isn't. It's accurate. It's, it's accurate. That's right. Because <clears throat> there isn't anything apart from the one. To be at all is to be one. But see, that makes it the thing. But it's more than that. It's, it's, cur it's really extremely curious. As a matter of fact, I think it's, an, it's very close to being a joke. There's nothing, there's nothing that isn't a one. And in a very real sense, well, like right now, the one is talking. Thank goodness. And I don't have to worry about it. <laughs> but... Uh, Pardon me? Chewing gum. Louder? Chewing gum. It's, it is chewing gum. Well, here, I want to Okay. <clears throat> this is the part, see, he's saying that one has to buy, an, it's an inner power that we have that's similar to, and it's from the one, Right? There's something within us, there's a certain inner power. There has to be an inner power in us because we want to reach it. There's something about us that wants to resolve this mystery about the it, about what we are, what it is, what it is. That, that's a kind of inner power, he says. It's similar and from the one. That's the object of contemplation. But it can't become an object. Therefore, you can't contemplate it. So therefore, you can walk around in wonder. And that's the preparation, to stand in wonder. So when we contain no difference in ourselves, given everything it up, right? You see, we're always around the one, dissolve without it. But through it, we exist on a higher degree, a more profound degree. When we reach it, share in it, and recognize the dispenser of true life. But 
this is his language, but it's rather curious. You see, when you reach it, it's not an it. And when you share an it, it's not an it. But we have to talk about it, and so we have to be careful about it, because we don't want to, to, to violate its integrity. And we just did. <laughs> but um, what see what it's what it's see what it's doing that this dialogue is doing. See if I can make it clear now. Um, <clears throat> This whole thing that we're doing assumes that there is a subject, the I or the self, <clears throat> that can identify with it or the one. And that's just what has to be rejected. That has to be rejected. See, that has to be because if there were a subject, it would have some delineation, some form, some perceptible boundary to it. It would have to be distinguished from other things. And if so, it ain't going to be and the it or the one. So then let me go back now. Look here, see. Here's the big question, I think. <clears throat> Why not bypass all of this talk and simply make the transition directly to the one? Therefore, end all distinctions but you see, he's ending all distinctions too. You see, this is using the mind to persuade the mind that it's not at war or in some ridiculous reality. Because he says very clearly, when we contain no difference, or what I would say when we're no longer attached to any difference, then without difference, we know what is. No, that's negative, when we contain no difference, that's negative. That's not any different than what the Buddhist would be saying when he says, stamp out everything in your mind, when he depreciates the mind, only he's doing it negatively. Reason and understanding shows how you can understand why you have to go beyond it. And therefore, you're not at war with understanding and you're not at very, you're, you are not <clears throat> in opposition or in ver in, at variance with your own mind or That's intellect. Right. The Buddhists talk about annihilating thoughts. Yeah. Much like a double-edged sword, ch 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 yeah. chopping the thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. Very, yeah. Is it a more yeah. image? Uh, yeah, Satani so says uh, uh, the mind, uh, uh, thoughts are the sickness of the mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is saying, oh, sure but you don't have to knock it down so much. You can understand, you can go through understanding and put things in its place so that you are then bringing yourself harmoniously up through this. Because the problem so that's in- That's the dropping away then, dropping yeah. it. Yeah. It's like a process of dropping it. Or our understanding its particular role and how it functions and it doesn't have to be other than what it is. And when that takes place, you're not at war with yourself. And uh, see, because uh, especially in, in the, if anyone was to be really consistent about it, they wouldn't even deny intellect, because that's using words. And you can't have a koan system to deny words. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. You can't give lectures and mm. 
Doku signs and all of those yeah. things and, and uh, deny the use of the mind. So that this is a harmonious way of blending. And this is the Platonic, Neoplatonic tradition. And so I made some copies of some major sections of Plotinus what I'd like to pass out to you. And uh, if you have any questions while I pass these around, please let me have them. We'll have some fun with them. These are all from the essential Plotinus of O'Brien's translation. And uh, it's a very beautiful translation. This is a complete set. And you can take one and pass this around. Take one more and pass that around. No, no, she already oh, has a set. Thank you. Oh, she has Last a set. One. Should have three pieces of paper oh, when you okay. finish. The colors are the result of a Xerox machine. The material is the same. Now, I wanted to get you to look at just a very beautiful section. Yes, yes. page 88, conclusion. Now, he's in this, he's talking about this state, the transition from the pure light of being to the one. Now, the realm of intelligence is said to be an image of the one. Now, if you look upon yourself in this state, you find yourself an image of the one. If you rise beyond yourself, an image rising to its model, you have reached the goal of your journey. When you fall from this vision, you will, by arousing the virtue that is within yourself and by remembering the perfection that you possess, retain your likeness and through virtue rise to the intelligence and through wisdom to the one. Such is the life of the divinity and the divine, and blessed men. Detachment from all things here below, scorn of all earthly pleasures, the flight of the lone to the alone. And that's his famous quote, the flight of the lone to the alone. I'm now on 84. As the one does not contain any difference, it's always present. And we are present to it when we no longer contain difference. The one does not aspire to us to move around us. We aspire to it to move around it. Actually, we always move around it, but we do not always look. We are like a chorus grouped about a conductor who allowed there a attention to be distracted by the audience. If, however, they were to turn towards their conductor, they would sing as they should. 
and would really be with him. We are always around the one. If we were not, we would dissolve and cease to exist. Yet our gaze does not remain fixed upon the one. When we look at it, we then attain the end of our desires and find rest. Then it is that all discord past, we dance an inspired dance around it. Wow. That's my contribution. Yeah, that's a dance of Shiva. He is an absolutely beautiful writer. He's the beauty that this man is able to put and the way he can express himself about the most profound of subjects places him way up above the most philosophers and history of philosophy into the truly greats. So, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. They don't study Plotinus much, do they? Pardon me? He has not studied much in his schools. More than Proclus, but... Uh, I don't really know. Uh, I know it's studied quite a bit in Golden West College. Yeah. <laughs> for some reason. Hmm. That's where I teach. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no. Uh, this is the kind of literature that is as profound as it is beautiful, yeah. as inspiring, it's beautiful to me. Right? as it is capable of moving the soul of man to something higher. It's the kind of thing our society needs. It always needs it. And we live in an age now when all of this is being published and it's available to us. There was a time when this was closed, couldn't get into it. Now it's all out. Paperbacks, this volume, which I took it from, beautiful edition, paperback. There's also a six volume work out now, just translated from the Loeb Library. The last volume's just been translated. And it's a, it's a, he calls it entering into the mysteries. Here, let me give you a good quote. Let me give you a good quote. I think he's quite right. It's making the mysteries available to mankind. Eleven on page eighty seven. <clears throat> Therefore it is it is so very difficult to describe this vision for how can we present it pre how can we present as different from us what seemed while we were contemplating it no other than ourselves, but perfect at oneness with us. This doubtless is what is back of the injunction of the mystery religions which prohibit revelation of the uninitiated. The divine is not expressible, so the initiate is forbidden to speak of it to anyone who has not been fortunate enough to have beheld it himself. The vision, in any case, did not imply duality. The man who saw was identical with what he saw. Hence, he did not see it, but rather was one with it. If only he could preserve the memory of what it was, while thus absorbed into the one, he could possess within himself an image of what it was. In that state he attained unity, nothing within him or without affecting diversity. When he made his ascent, there was within him no disturbance, no anger, emotion, desire, reason, or thought. Actually, he was no longer himself, but swept away and filled with the divine. Still, solitary, at rest, not turning to the side, or even towards himself. Utter rest. Actually, so to say, become rest itself. He 
He has risen above beauty. He's passed even beyond the choir of virtues. Right? So, I think our people may, with all of this literature, start living on a higher, more profound level. I think it's inevitable. How can you follow the TV? Everybody would rather watch TV than... Oh, all we need is a couple of nuts in every generation. We don't need too many. Right? I mean, the word has to get out. What I would like to see is one of these sitcoms, you know, like one of the figures show up every once in a while who represents this kind of thought and the kind of effect it has on whatever is going on. You know, just some rational person coming in with a more profound view of life, walking in the door and walking out and doing something in the, you know, they owe him or her. All right, so that is built in, that's all. Might even make them more interesting. I think I'm so. Watching. I think so. I think so. I'm watching. Yeah. Who would have thought there was a place for Doonesbury? Right. Yeah. Yeah. These ideas are coming out. I saw the movie um, Powder over the weekend. Have you seen that? No. No. I... It's about this uh, person whose mother was uh, struck by lightning when she was pregnant with him. And uh, after he's born, he, it, it turns out that he has this incredible intelligence off the scale, and he can read us others' thoughts. And he, he understands that, um, mm -hmm. that we're not separate. Mm -hmm. And he's, he's asked, well, what do you see when you, when you look at other people? And he said, well, they, they think they're separate, but they're not. Mm -hmm. They have something up here that makes See? them feel like they're separate. Mm. And he could understand, uh, you know, what they were thinking. It was someplace where they were sh they shot a deer. Someone was hunting, mm -hmm. and he put his hand on the deer as it was dying, and then he put his other hand and held the man who had shot it, and so the other man he was feeling everything the deer was feeling, oh. and so that the other man could uh, who had shot it could feel. also feel everything oh. that the deer was feeling in its death agonies. And so he went home. The man who had shot the deer went home, and of course gave away all his, got rid of all his guns, and would never shoot again so, because he could feel so, the agony of the other. So these right. kinds of things are coming out. Isn't it? It's yeah. a beautiful movie. Yeah. I recommend it. When you compare them against the movies in my life, my early life, you know, uh, half of them, even even at the time, were weren't worth going to see. Even Stylized Hollywood stars. They the. Uh, yeah. Stories were always stylized, predictable. Yeah. Had nothing in them, really, for me. The uh, Razor's Edge, where they, yeah, the, they yeah. the character in there in the book itself, Red Plotinus, mm -hmm. it wasn't really captured in the film. No. Right. That's right. And actually, they did a remake of it, too, and it wasn't captured in that one either. So. No. Matter of fact, in the end of that Razor's Edge, the last chapter has a beautiful summary of uh, Hindu philosophy. Yeah. Quote in here, the flight of the lone to the alone is in. I, that quote, the flight of the lone to the alone, yes. is in. Is in the, the razor's edge. Right. Ah. In, the in the book. Yeah. But not in the movie. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, I think this is quite an interesting age. Is really, I mean, this is the like within a hundred miles of where we're sitting. I'm sure we can find any number of people who can claim all kinds of, of psychics energies floating around them, insight, states of mind, spirituality. And among all of them are likely to be a couple of genuine ones. You can even get something from a fool. The fool is a zero in the tarot cards. Yes. Yeah. If, you're, if you're lucky enough. <laughs> well, not, but after you go from the loan to the loan, then you still have to come back to the marketplace. Well, <clears throat> you see, what's going to happen, you see, if you just want last thought on that, is that uh, through philosophy, through this kind of philosophy, it, it re-emphasizes in a, in a dramatic way the whole subject of beauty and the, nat the natural need for a language that can express it and that language is the language of beauty and love. 
that gives back a vitality and an integrity to language. It cuts through all relativity. And that's so important for any culture that's going to live, create. And that's why I think it's where we're, if we can you know, hold back the ecological mess in front of us, there may be a nice place for mankind to grow and develop because we have all the literature, we have the people, we have the interests. But what were you saying about the language of love? Language of love is the language that is used to explore this realm. Oh, okay. And you say that that then Brings cuts back, through relativity? Doesn't it? Using that language, yes. Yeah. Because it has all those ideas of union and... Yeah. And it talks about the, there has to be an integrity. has to be an integrity mm -hmm. to the language. And of course, the whole issue in, in, among many people is whether or not it's rhetoric. That is empty rhetoric, not just skillful use of language. Well, language seems to be losing its integrity. I mean, we get so caught up into different, uh, what do you call it, different idioms, that yes. sometimes the words lose their meaning. Yes, that's true. But a good dose of Plotinus will bring it back. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.